Hello and welcome to the iPhotography Guide to Pixar. This is a free online editor built within the iPhotography website. I'm going to show you all the bells and whistles that are featured in Pixar so you can get started and start editing your images straight away. So if you're brand new to iPhotography or you've never used Pixar before on our website, you can simply find it in the menu bar under the resources section called Pixlr Editor. Let's go a bit closer in and start looking at all the features. So this is the interface of Pixlr. It's super simple and it's really, really easy to use. As I say, if you're not a Photoshop or Lightroom user, if you prefer to keep your costs down, then as part of your iPhotography membership, Pixlr is all built into the website and there are so many features and so many different tweaks and changes that you can make to your images that I'm gonna show you today. So simply to open an image, all you need to do is press open and then you can pick out any image from your computer. And then the whole interface expands once it's got your image uploaded onto the website. You'll see a toolbar to the left hand side, which has got most of the tools that we're actually going to use during this overview. If you hover over them, a lot of them give you a bit of information about how to use them and what they're for. But I'm going to show you that in a little bit more detail. At the bottom of the page, you've got the option to close your image or to save it once you've done your work. And on the right hand side, very similar to Photoshop, if you've used it before, you've also got the options of layers. So this will give us the ability to stack multiple images or text upon layers as well, which I'll show you. But initially, let's work down from the top and I'll show you different buttons and what they do. The properties button here gives you the option to resize your image. So if your image is quite large and you're trying to upload it to the iPhotography gallery, for example, you can simply press on that button. It currently tells you how wide and how tall your image is in terms of pixels. So if you need to bring it under the 5,000 pixel threshold for iPhotography, just simply type in a number that's below 5,000. So from here, we could change it to 3,000 and you see the proportions change perfectly. You can then press apply and the image has been resized. You can also change the canvas size. The canvas size is different to the image itself. The canvas is something that the image sits upon. So if you're wanting to add a border or more space around your image for part of a design, you can then press on canvas image, then change the size of the width and the height or just one of the other. So if you want to change it to 3500 on the width and then maybe 2200 for example. Now the anchor point gives us the option of changing the position. So currently our image sits in the middle of the canvas, but if we wanted to shift the image to say the left hand side, and then all the extra space that we're now creating with our new proportions is pushed to the right hand side of the frame, we can do that. So for example, so the image was in the middle, we've now selected the left hand side, and you can see now the image has moved over to the left and we've got that space around us. If you're unhappy with what you've done, if you want to change it, you've always got the options on many of these adjustments to redo or undo. So you can simply click back and you can change it again. The rotation buttons are pretty self-explanatory. You can change the rotation of your image for some reason if it's not been rotated in camera. You can go left, you can go right, you can flip it horizontally, you can flip it vertically. Now, if you have changed the size of your canvas, for example, if we change the size of our canvas again here, Let's type in some new proportions. And if we keep the image in the middle, we have now got an option of background here, which is more usable. Now that allows us to actually change the color of the canvas, that new area that we've added. And if we scroll down on our mouse and you can scroll inwards using your uh, scrolling wheel, if you have one on your mouse, then you can change the color of this background here as well. So if you'd like to add something a little bit more dramatic in terms of colors or a nice simple border around your photograph, you can do. You can either use from any of the presets at the top, choose your own color from the color slider here, or even use the little eyedropper and choose a color that's actually within the image. Just by hovering over on the crosshair, you can select it. And now the image has a slightly more closer relationship to the colors in the photograph. So that's the properties tab. When you're finished, you can simply just press close at the bottom and then you can move on to another tab. We'll look at the arrange one now. I think we'll change an image. So with the arrange tab, this is now going to work more in closer relationship to the layers. Our unlock option at the top is really important to press to begin with to make sure that we can edit our layers and move them around. So press unlock and now you've got the option here of being able to resize the image manually. You can type in 
the exact position that you'd like the image to be within the canvas area. But if you're not sure, you can just hold your mouse over the image and just press down and drag it into position exactly where you want it. Again, you've got the option of being able to rotate the image as we had before. Now the blend modes only really come into use when you're using multiple layers. Now on the right hand side, we've got our layers option here, but we've only got this one photograph on screen. So if we add some more by pressing the plus icon in the bottom here, it asks us, do we want to create a new layer that's empty? One with an image or one with text? So let's just press image and we'll get another photograph. And by choosing a new image now, you can see that we've got two layers, one that's our new image, and then underneath we've got our original. You can turn off the visibility, so if you wanted to see the image that was underneath, you can change that. You can also then change the positions of these layers as well. So you can now see that we've got a smaller image on top of our bigger image now we've changed the sizes. As I said, the blend modes are there to work with multiple layers. It won't work with one layer on its own. You need to have two for something to blend with. The options are a plenty. There's so many different variations and ways that you can blend images together. If you have used Photoshop before, all of these options here will be very similar and very familiar to you in terms of how they blend images. We've got the multiplier blend, which generally darkens the image by taking away any of the lighter areas. Screen, which does the opposite. But it's really good to go through and play around with these player blends, depending upon the concept and the project that you're actually working on, just so you can see the different types of blends and the different types of combinations it can create. You can also change the transparency of layers between images. Just by moving the transparency layer up and down, you can create a nice soft effect between two different images if you wanted. The other options down at the bottom are here to duplicate. So you can duplicate currently the layer that you're on. So we can add another version and then if we wanted to, we can move it around so you can still see that we've got our original behind and another version of this gate photograph. You can also delete it simply by pressing delete on the keyboard or just pressing this icon here. You'll also find lots of those options in respects to layers are also available by clicking on the layer itself. If you hover over the layer, you get this three dot icon. You press on it and you can give a name to your layer. You can change the blend mode and the transparency as well. You've also got the options again of duplicating the layer as well as deleting it. So let's move on to our next tab now, and this is the crop tool. It's as simple as it sounds. This again gives us the option that we can type in our parameters here for different pixels um, to crop the image exactly how we want. But to be honest, the easiest way of using it is using the boundary box that's provided when we go onto the tool to begin with. It's not held to any constraints at the minute. So as you can see, it's not following any certain aspect ratios. So we can choose the crop exactly as we want. We can pull it down from the top, we can do the exact same from the side. We can even go to the corner points and bring it down. So this gives us absolute flexibility of being able to make sure that we get the crop exactly how we want it. So once we've got our crop, say for example, if we come a little bit closer in here and a bit tighter, all we need to do is then press apply. So once we press apply, that means the crop is then fixed. We can also go back still and press undo if we've made a mistake. Now, if you wanted to actually restrain your image to a certain aspect ratio, you can simply press the select aspect option. So if we go back to our original version of our image, we can press select aspect and then we can type in the ratio that we want. So simply it's given us a one to one ratio at the minute, which is a square, but we could add in something maybe like a, a two to three, which is just a vertical version. So very much the same as how the image was to begin with. There are also presets down here as well. So you can follow some more common presets, others that are also designed for social media. So if you wanted to make sure your image is optimized for an Instagram post or a Facebook image, and um, then you've got lots of different options here, which are really, really helpful. So it means you don't have to remember any specific uh, ratios or actual sizes or pixel numbers or anything like that. You've got it all set there. If for any reason your image is just slightly off kilter as well, you've also so got this straighten option. So it's simply a case of being able to move it left and right and line your image up perfectly with your horizon. But that's as simple as the crop tool is. So the next tool that we've got to play with after our crop option is our cutout. And as it says, it's gonna help us to remove backgrounds, cut out objects or trim them down on individual layers. So if we press that, we've got a range of different options here. Now at the top here, we've got the AI cutout. Now with most things on Pixlr, they are free to use, but you will find with the AI cutout, for example, it is a premium feature within Pixlr. 
this is just a brief example as to how it would work. So it's not the world's best rendering. We may have to go in and actually cut out some other aspects a little bit further. Um, but if you want a more premium version of Pixlr, there is an option available online. But just looking at what it's done to begin with, it's not done the world's worst job. It surely would have saved me a lot of time to use that AI cutout and then to go in and just refine the edges here. The other options underneath the AI cutout are different shape cutouts. So one initially gives you options of different shapes that you can follow. So for example, if we chose a star, we can then draw that shape onto our image and then it cuts out an area that just was in that star shape. Now, if you undo it, we can go back to other ones. We can choose hearts. So these are kind of quite nice, quite cute. So if you're wanting to uh, maybe produce an image that's going to go into a card or a picture frame or something like that, and you want it to have a certain shape, then it could be kind of quite nice for some more fun scrapbooking projects. Again, we've got our magic cutout, which is maybe not too different from our AI cutouts. So Pixlr is going to have a look at the image and try and kind of do its best selection based upon where we actually choose. Now you've got options here initially of keep and remove. So our selections can be based upon areas that we want to get rid of or ones we want to keep. So if we just wanted to keep a particular area, we can then just press on it. And then it's done its absolute best to pick out all the other areas and elements of our image with a similar color value. Now, if we wanted to remove them parts, press remove and then press that again. And now, as you can see, it's ended up with that checkerboard background, which, as we all know, basically means there's nothing there. There's no information. Now, depending upon the severity of the selection that you want, you can change that with the tolerance. The higher the tolerance means it's going to be selecting more and more of the image within that color value to around about the tolerance of about 80 extra pixels surrounding it. So if we increase it and then we make our selection again, you can see now it's actually included the flowers in the background, whereas it hadn't before. Now, if we undo that and we reduce the tolerance, so it's now only going to be selecting a very, very small portion based upon our initial click, we should only get a small result. There we go, as you can see. So we've got a very, very small area of pixels of a similar color value. So you'll have to play around with the tolerance level a little bit depending upon your image as to how much you want and how little you want selected. The contiguous option again is very, very similar to Photoshop. If we turn this off and make a selection again, it's selecting all parts of the image, or at least it's looking at all parts of the image to make a selection based upon our initial click. Now, if we turn the contiguous option on and make the same selection again, it's not selected as much and there are some areas that it's left out a little bit. Tend to find leaving the contiguous option is generally a little bit easier to work without. Then the options at the bottom here of extractors layer, invert cutout or reset, again, give us the options to either. Once we've made our selection, for example, we can now create a whole new layer based upon that selection. So you can see we've actually now got two versions of our selection. If we undo that, and now if we make our selection again, we can then invert the cutout. So if by accident we forgot to press uh, remove instead of keep, we can always change it by inverting our selection. So if you've done one rather than the other, you don't have to go undo and then redo it again. You can just press invert cutout. If you decide you don't like it at all, you can always press reset. So back at the top, we've got another way of being able to make a selection. This is draw cutout. Again, we've got the options of keep and remove, which is quite nice because it's, uh, it's highlighted them in either a green to keep or a red to remove. There is options underneath that little preview of being able to make the brush size larger. We can make the head of the brush softer so we can see the edges fade out a little bit more. If we want our brush to be a bit more defined in a hard edge, we can make it so. Now, the way this brush works so if we keep it a little bit larger, and we'll make it that little less softer, you can actually see now the size of the brush appearing on the image. Now, this is all being done by one single click. So if I've not lifted my finger off the mouse, I'm just making the selection of the area. So everything I'm selecting at the minute is going green. Now, what I'm going to do is just come into the flowers purposely, but also make it look a bit accidental. Then when I take my finger off the mouse, you can see everything I have selected is included there. Now, if I'm making numerous selections, like another one there and another one there and another one down here, it's adding all those different areas in. So after every time you lift your finger off your mouse, 
you'll see a new area is selected. So it's a little bit more of a manual approach, but if you've got a very, very tricky outline. So say for example, if we go backwards a few steps and we zoom closer into our image, so if we press remove this time and we'll try and see if we can actually remove the background to this flower. So again, we're making singular clicks and we're just dragging our mouse around. So there will be a lots of adjustments. You will have to change the size and the, the hardness of your brush depending upon the object that you're actually working around. So there we have our background arrays. Now, as you can see, it's not absolutely perfect by any means, but I've just been trying to go through this fairly quickly just to give you an idea of at least how it works. Now, if for any instance you get areas like it is with this flower here, where you've maybe cut out a little bit more than you expect. So maybe if we just go in a little bit tighter and we've just actually removed part of that uh, petal that we didn't want to, can we undo that? The answer is yes, we can. So again, if you're familiar with Photoshop or if you've ever used bits of it before, um, this cutout tool, this draw cutout tool is very, very similar to using a layer mask. So effectively the keep would be bringing back information. This would be like using a white brush um, with a layer mask on Photoshop and the black brush would be more like the remove. So we can remove bits and by pressing the keep button and making sure our brush is green, we can then restore those areas that we have removed. So it's a non-destructible form of editing, which is really, really great, just especially when you're making these selections. If you're not zoomed in super tight, you may miss over areas that you should have selected, but you can just go back and refine that a little bit just to make sure that your selection is as neat and as clean as possible. Now the last option in our cutout panel is the lasso. Again, very, very similar to Photoshop. I can see where it's got a lot of its ideas from as Pixar. So instead of having to brush a certain area um, or select it with a magic wand or use a specific shape to make your selection, this is again is a more manual choice. So I'm gonna go a little bit closer in on this flower and then we'll actually just draw a line around the center of the area that we want to select. So let's try and see if we can pick out the middle of this flower. You can draw around of it as many times as you want. And the selection will be based upon the widest points that you're, uh, you're making. So if we selected something a little bit larger like that, it's gonna select that entire outline there. So you can go in and be a little bit more manual. If you didn't like the idea of the brush, you could go in a bit closer and just select out one petal. If you're using a, a tablet, a graphics tablet and a, and a pen to make these kind of adjustments and these changes, that's probably kind of quite useful for the lasso tool because you can use your pen to be a little bit more specific with the drawing. The same options apply with keep and remove. So if we use remove, this time we get a red line around it and that's what's being cut out. Same options about the softness. This is like the feathering around the edges so we can make that selection not so harsh and defined. We can make it a bit softer and a bit lighter if we prefer. Again, we can also extract that as a particular layer, invert the cutout and also reset it. So all the same options are applying there. So I think we'll move on to our next tool now. So our next feature is probably one you're gonna use more than anything, and this is the adjustment tools. So the adjustment tools, again, they show you pretty much exactly what they're gonna do just by their name. So the most of them are quite self-explanatory. There's another automated option to give you an auto fix on your image. So if you click that, it gives you a quick rendering as to what Pixar thinks needs adjusting in your image, which is sometimes very helpful. You can still then go on to make more manual adjustments afterwards. But to be honest, if you want that absolute control, I'd probably avoid from the auto fix option there. So if you press undo, the first two options at the top here, one, we can edit is solely in black and white. So now some of the options become more specific to black and white editing. We can then straight away invert our image if you want to do something really creative. But looking down at our color sliders here, we can change the vibrance of the image. We can change the saturation, the color balance, make things cooler, make things warmer. We can change the tint on the image as well as the overall hue. So if we wanted to go a little bit more psychedelic and completely change all the colors, we can do. There's more basic options further down. So you can collapse these menus by just pressing the little arrow at the side. So these basic menus, very similar to Lightroom, give you the option of brightening the exposure overall, because this image is a little bit dark. So it probably does deserve or require a little bit more boost in exposure. So we can do that with those two sliders. The contrast we can reduce or increase depending upon how much contrast we actually want within the image. The black areas we can suppress that a little bit further or we can lighten a little bit more if we wanted to. 
I think it's a little bit dark on this river shot, so I think we will reduce it ever so slightly. Same again with the whites. If we didn't want those highlights in the waterfall to be kind of so bright, we can then just reduce that a little bit further. The highlights again, very similar, like with the white areas. So with the highlights, again, we can increase the brightness of them. So that's just the really, really white areas of the shot. So even though we were moving the white slider before, that's actually making, as you can see, an overall difference to the image in terms of the brightness. But with the highlights, it's a bit more specific to the very, very, very bright parts of the picture. Same again with the shadows. Though we've adjusted the blacks before, the shadows are areas that have no detail in at all. So you can brighten these up a little bit if you wanted to bring back a bit more detail, but be very wary about brightening it too much because it can make the image look very flat and also quite noisy. So that's the light panel. You've then also now got another option about toning. So we can change the amount, you can set it initially and that'll be them changing based upon the preset colours here. So if you wanted to have an overall tone, make your image look a little bit more vintage or a bit more period, you can choose your image more specifically if you're going for a certain type of look. If you're not into that kind of thing, I'd probably avoid from the overall toning panel there. The fill option here we can increase and this just gives us a color overlay. So this could be quite useful potentially by adding another layer, a blank layer and then adding a fill to it and then you can maybe use different blending modes to just change the effect overall. But you can increase and decrease the effect completely if you wanted to add a bit of a morning mist to an image and make it look a bit softer, maybe a white fill could be quite nice. Again you can type in your own color codes if you know them or you can potentially select a color based upon a tone within the image. So if you wanted to make it a little bit more stylized, you can do. And again, there's blending modes here if you were using a separate layer and that color fill. The curves option is the last in our list. So it gives us this graph that we can plot points on. As it said, we need to double click to add or remove a control point. So whereas in things like Photoshop, it's just a single click, it's a double click in Pixlr. We can then push that line up, increase the brightness, we can make things darker. We can decide to add another point if we wanted to make something more like a, an S curve. And we can add another one down the bottom. So to remove one, we just simply double click on a point and it goes away. We can then brighten up our highlights, reduce our shadows a bit further and add a lot more contrast into the shot. If you double click on a point, it just resets the, the line back into the middle. We can then also now play with our color channels more specifically. So our red channels, we can add curves to. So you can see by example that if we pull our curve down using our red channel, it introduces more green as the opposite of red is green. And if we boost it, we're going to include more reds. So again, you can undo all this by double clicking on the control points. You can then go to your green channels instead and you can increase green by reducing it. You introduce more magenta and red. Same with blue, you can double click. We can get more of a blue tone onto our image by reducing it, we bring in more yellows and greens. So there's loads of different options to play around with, with this adjustment option here. When you're happy with all the adjustments that you've made to your image, make sure you press apply before you press save to make sure all your changes are stuck on the image. So after the adjust option, we come down to filter. So we've got lots of different options here. As Pixel says, so it gives us the opportunity now to be able to blur, sharpen, smoothen an image, add a bit of a vignette, maybe some green and some other little bits and pieces. So these are more like effects you could see them as to some point. So let's go in a little bit closer and we'll see how good they are. So this image itself is not perfectly sharp um, in the distance here, but let's see by using this uh, slider if we can increase a little bit more detail and we can. Obviously it's always kind of being very mindful to make sure you don't go too far to make the image look a little bit grainy or a little bit noisy. But as it stands, that's not actually done a very bad job at all. So from where it was before, maybe if we uh, slide across to look at these people on the far side, which wouldn't naturally be sharp because they are on the very, very edge of the frame. If we increase that sharpness, we can see we've got a lot more detail in them. It's not perfectly clear, but it's certainly not done a bad job at all. So let's zoom back out to our original image. Now we've got our clarity as our next slider. So this is going to increase the little bits of texture and detail. So if we go back into these leaves in this tree. If we increase that slider, you can see there's a lot more crispness in the detail. Now this is something you may not want overall, you may just want in certain areas, which is very, very tricky to then change unless you're selecting areas specifically, adding it as a new layer and then making these further changes. So make sure you remember that any changes that you make at this point are global. 
By reducing the clarity, you can also see it gives an overall softness, so more of a, a watercolor type effect to the image. The smoothen option does a very similar job to reducing the clarity. It just makes a little bit of a softer area to the image. This could be really useful for working on portraits for skin tones for children and babies. It can make it look that little bit softer. So that's where it was originally. And if we increase it, we can see the edges of these flowers and these leaves just that get that little bit softer in terms of the contrast against the tree. The blur will do a very similar job again as well. If we zoom out that bit further, it now looks like we all need glasses. So we can go from where we were with our original image and just add an overall blur. So this is probably going to be quite useful if, for example, we wanted to make uh, multiple versions of this image. So for example, let's actually make a new layer. And if we duplicate the layer that we've got, so if we press on our image, we duplicate it. And if we use a tool that we've looked at a little bit earlier, which was the Arrange tool, we've now got these boundary boxes to be able to make our image smaller. So we've now got our layer which we can produce and move around on top. So we'll settle that in the middle. And then we'll actually go back to our filter option as before. Make sure we press apply first, and then we'll go back to our filter option. So to do so, make sure you've got your background layer selected, and then we can increase the blur. And you can see now it adds quite a nice border to our new version of our image. So we've got a softer edge and a sharper edge to it, which is sometimes kind of quite nice if you don't want to just a harsh white or a harsh black border this is a nice way of being able to retain some of the colors from the original image into the background so that's just one way potentially of using the blur tool so underneath the blur we've got grain now you may think why would you want to use something like that but it could be kind of quite useful depending upon the image that you're using if it's a period type of shot that you're trying to create and you want to maybe add in some sort of film effects then the grain could be very very useful so let's zoom in a little bit onto this water and if we add that grain you can see there is that noise that starts to develop. If we reduce it again, you can see it's a bit softer on the water. And if we increase it, it gives us a little bit more texture and a bit more detail. But again, you have to be very, very careful with how you use this because it can make your image look lower quality overall. Further down after the details part of this panel, we have also now got our scene. Now, some of these could be really, really useful for certain types of shots. So it's not to say that all these options here are going to work really, really well on this little landscape picture we've got. Vignettes are very, very popular, maybe not so much white ones, but you can, by drawing the slider to the left hand side, create a white vignette around our image. If we zoom out a little bit further, you can see the benefits of using a black one. So you can increase the intensity of it and how much it creeps into the edge of the shot. So this can be quite nice to focus attention on a certain area when you've got a singular subject in the middle. Other tools such as Dehaze can do somewhat of a similar job, but it applies it to the image more globally as opposed to the edges. If you're shooting early morning and you wanted to reduce some of the morning haze or the mist, this is the perfect tool to do so. Bloom tool brightens the overall exposure just on the highlights. So if you're wanting to soften and brighten skin to make it look that little bit more softer, that bit more appealing, that can be very, very useful in the same way as the Glamour tool does as well. Now, this makes things a little bit more crisp, a little bit more defined in detail. I think these are probably going to be tools that are more suitable uh, to portraits more specifically. OK, so the Posturize tool is going to be a bit of a hit and miss. You may really like it, you may not. You may think the effect of it is just far too much, but you can make it look quite stylized. Again, maybe if it's going to be the background to another image, as we looked at before by layering, it could be quite effective. But to be honest, for photographers, that is another one that I'm probably going to skip. Pixelate is the same as well, unless you're wanting your image to look completely blurred. If it's part of a collage or a montage, it can be very, very useful. Same again with Mosaic as well. These are fantastic if you're creating styles of works or if you wanted to break down your image to create some sort of fun and abstract game as to a, kind of a what am I, a guess what I am. These can be kind of quite useful and playful in that instance, but generally in parts of photography editing, um, it's probably not used a, a huge amount. So that's the filter tool. I think we'll uh, close this image, we'll move on to a new one and we'll start to have a look at the effects panel. So next up is our effects panel. Now our effects are basically presets. So they're pre-made effects as it says to change the look and the feel of a bitmap player. Um, these are really, really easy to use. They're pretty much one-click solutions. You can still go on to change elements about it, but 
it lists down here a subpanel of lots of different categories. So there are options within each of these categories. These are just like the feature images. So you can make uh, retro effects here if you press on one and then you've got lots of different presets which apply straight away or give you at least a preview um, as to how it will look with your image. So before even clicking on it, you can then make your decision. So if you like this one called Hagrid, you can then press it, it applies to the image, and then you can change the actual density of the effect if you want it to be just as clear as it is on the preview, or you can soften it back a little bit further. You can instead choose different ones, and you can reduce it that little bit more. Whenever you're happy with the actual level of effect that you've applied, make sure you also press the apply button for it to stick. If you don't like it, if you want to go back and change, just press cancel, then just go back again to the effects panel, and you can choose different ones instead. So let's have a look at the artsy ones and see what kind of uh, crazy and creative effects that can be applied here. So this is a little bit similar to the mosaic actually we were looking at just previously. Um, other ones like night vision, you may not necessarily find that useful, but again, it's all down to the actual image that you're working on and the effect that you want to create. As long as you know what the options are, you can apply it as much or as little as you so wish. You can scroll back up the list and then just press back if you want to then go back to all the options that previously have a look at some other ones further down we've also got some more specific options and presets that are made for portraits and food and nature and urban so let's actually give a, a nature one a try given that we've got our image here this forest one looks quite nice so it it does saturate the shot quite a bit it gives us a lot more color and detail in the greens it's not done too much to the sky really but in terms of the actual initial colors on the shot it can be very very useful so that's ultimately how effects work they're very very simple options you've got lots of different choices in there something that you'll never get bored with playing around some that are quite crazy and quite creative others that are a little bit more sympathetic so give them a try so our liquify tool is our next feature we're going to have a look at so this is going to be kind of quite useful as it shows on the demonstration image there it's brilliant to use for portraits but it's not to say it's the only place that it can be used um, it's going to allow us to grow or shrink or push parts of the image around the actual photograph itself it, it kind of just it's basically a distortion tool if you think of it and um, which can be used kind of quite nicely to flatter in portraits um, but it can also be used as you can see for a little bit of humor as well so just so you know how it works there's a number of options at the top here in terms of the direction and the actual manner of how an image is liquefied so the first option is push so we've got options which will have throughout all these different six um, all these different five options sorry here because one's the last one is restore um, you can change the size of the head of the uh, liquefy area so let's just make it a little bit bigger and we'll try and get it close to the center center size there we go we're not far off there anyway and um, the center size of our little flower we can change the strength again that's how much of the effect is going to be applied with every single click let's keep it in the middle to begin with and the same with the density so all we need to do is just click in the middle hold down on our mouse and if we push we can push those areas in the middle of our selection to the edge there so we're actually making everything larger a little bit more distorted so this is the push option if we wanted to make things a little bit wider we can do now let's just have a look at another option so we'll just restore and we'll go back from where we were previously so it's pretty much going to work as you'd expect so if you hold that down now if you hold down the effect will continue to apply for as long as you've got your mouse held down if you also move and then push your mouse at the same time it will create this skewered effect where everything looks like it's growing larger in more of a, of a ball shape. So a little bit similar to the push tool, but it adds way more distortion and keeps this kind of constant circular shape going. So everything looks like it's bulging. This is really kind of fun to use on eyes, but actually it's looking kind of quite pretty in the center of this little flower here because it's given us this nice little uh, a slick effect in the center this almost looks like a like oil techniques that you see in photography where you get these little mixes of um, of oil kind of around with different food colorings and it can be really really kind of cool quite quite a smart little idea really just sometimes you find these by accident and you apply these effects and you don't know if they're going to work so well but it's actually come up a little bit better than I expected so let's go back and we'll have a look at the next one which is shrink which you could probably understand as to how that will work in comparison to the enlarge so looking at the shrink option next, again, we've just made sure our brush is kept at the same size so we can keep the consistency. And now 
just by holding down on the mouse over a certain area. You can move it at the same time. It basically suckers everything in to the middle crosser of our head. So if we want to make our effect maybe a little bit more refined, we can just make our head a little bit smaller on our brush, or we can make it bigger. And basically it looked like everything's turning inside out. If we hold it down a little bit longer. We actually kind of create these maybe like two little buds. And if we do it again here and do it again there, we just almost start to suck of the center of this flower almost into its like our own little black hole and it creates this new little bit of a design. So the next two options on the bottom row are very similar but just opposite to each other. We've got a swirl right and a swirl left. If you just increase the size of the head of our brush, we'll actually increase the effect this time. So again, just hold it wherever you want and it's just going to distort the image so it twirls it to the right hand side. Same again if we did with the left, it just does it in the opposite way. So this can be quite nice to use on patterns, so you're creating more of an abstract look on patterns overall. So that is just an overview of the Liquify tool on Pixlr. Um, let's have a look at our next tab now. The retouch panel is really, really helpful for making minor little tweaks and changes to your image. This is more like airbrushing or patching up images. Um, so this is why I've chosen this image of the flower here, because there are a couple of little blemishes just on some of the petals that I thought this could be very, very useful just to demonstrate as to how to remove. Now, there's a couple of options here um, in this retouch panel on Pixlr. So you've initially got heal and repair, which is probably the one that you're going to use the most of, I'm very honest. The clone stamps there as well, that which will help, but to be honest, the heal and repair I found does a much better job. There's also a sharpen and blur tool, which again, you shouldn't really need to use too much because we have got options further up that we've looked at before in the adjust panel when we can change the details by adding more sharpness or adding a bit more blur. Um, so these are more slightly more localized options though. If you do want to, this is where they are within Pixlr. And then dodge and burn, which is gonna help you add maybe a bit more contrast by darkening specific areas or lightening specific areas. So these are more what we refer to as local adjustments. But let me just show you one or two options. Let me show you the heal and repair because as I said, I think this is gonna be the one that would help you the most. Um, there's two options here about either using it by patch or infill, I'll show you the differences. Let's just increase the size of our brush. So this is our selection area. If we increase it more, you can see it's gonna get bigger. So simply with patch, it's just a one click solution. We find the blemish that we've got and we just press it once and then it takes it away. Now, if we undo it, I'll show you the difference with doing infill because doing it in fill, it allows you to draw an area. So if you've got a bit of a blemish here and maybe another one over there, it's going to allow you to draw a path and anything that's within that path um, is considered basically to be removed. So I'll draw over it here. As you can see, it may be this whole area, you may find another little bit that you want to remove, but it makes it takes maybe a couple of seconds or two, depends upon the speed of your computer and the size of your image but there you go, it's removed it. So it was just working out based upon the image around it, what it should fill in on that area that you've selected. Now, the other aspect that I think would be quite useful to have a look at is the burn and dodge. So the dodge area is effectively the lightening. So this is lightening either the dark areas, the mid areas or the light areas. So generally um, you're using the dodge tool to basically lighten up highlights in the image. So if we increase the size of the brush, can make it a bit softer, maybe increase the strength of it a little bit more. And just say around the edge of the flower here to make it really pronounced, we can make some areas really bright and really clear. On the opposing side, you've got darken. Generally, the darken, what we call the burn, is used um, within the dark areas or in the shadows, maybe just to increase shadow detail a little bit more. You can sometimes use it on the mids a little bit as well. Uh, same again, we'll keep the uh, brush that soft, a little bit larger and we'll keep the strength high and you can see the shadows in the background there we're just going to make way darker so we'll show it on the flower as well so you can see now what effect it gives so you have to be very very careful i think the strength is going to be one of the biggest things if you can make this a little bit softer you can sometimes make the effect that little more realistic by changing it to the midtones it doesn't affect the image as much it's just areas that are a little bit dark but not too heavy and again, using the darken tool on a light setting, you see now how it's actually making these yellow areas quite dark and quite flat, really. So this is why we probably don't use the burn tool that much or the darken option, as it's called in Pixlr, on this range of light. So keep the light to light and then the darken to either mid or dark. 
So those are the main tools that I think you'd probably be most beneficial for a photographer in Pixlr on this retouch tool. Now the next two options on Pixlr are very, very similar. The first one is drawing. Now you may not use this a lot as a photographer, but again, I wanna make sure that you're aware of it in case for your design, your project, whatever you're doing, it is useful or you're looking for something to be able to add extra to your image. So drawing is effectively as it says it would. You've got the brush tool, you've got an eraser tool, you've got a pen, which is very similar to the brush, but it just does it with a slightly different effect on top, or you've got a shape. So these are different things that you can add on top of your image if you want to write a little bit of text there is also a dedicated text button as well now I'd recommend when using either the drawing or the text tool is to make sure we add a separate layer because if you add it directly to the layer that you're on here to the image it's going to be really hard to make changes in terms of its positions or maybe colors a little bit later so if we add a new layer it's going to ask us do we want to keep it empty do we want to add an image or specifically text so just for this instance we'll keep it empty and um, now we'll just change the color and we can increase the size of the brush. We can again, as we've seen before, change the softness and the transparency. So it's then up to us that we can draw whatever we want on here. So how useful it is to you as a photographer is completely down to yourself. If you decide you play with it and you don't like it, you can use the eraser tool, make it a little bit larger, and then just take it away from there. As I said, the pen tool works very, very similar to the brush tool. It just has a slightly different type of head to it. And what I mean by that is that where it was kind of quite thick and quite wide, the actual brush for um, the brush tool, the pen tool, if we select a different color, as you can see, it's much narrower. Even if we increase the size of it, the overall effect to it is a lot narrower. We can increase the amount of it. We've got the opacity pumped right up there but it's a much more thin, narrower line. So if you're wanting to create some cool little patterns on your image, then potentially you can use it for that. But overall, I don't think it's gonna be the most uh, commonly used tool for you um, as a photographer. The shape option here, again, is there to use if you wish. You can draw shapes on top if you're wanting to make a cute little collage and then add type effects, you can do. So say, for example, we keep our uh, layer of our heart there and we go to our text tool. We can add new text, we press new text, and then that little icon at the top, that blue icon, allows us to rotate the text around if we wanted to. And try and get it back straight again. It's always the tricky thing. There we go. If you double click in that area, you can then add your text. So if we just type in some nature, there we go. If we highlight that text, you've got options down on the side panel here that we can change the alignment. We can move it left to right. We can change it to uppercase if it is already lowercase. We can italicize it and we can also add a boldness to it. You've also got options of changing the font if you wanted to, as well as the color to it. You can pick out a more specific color or take from the presets. Further down, you can increase the size, the line spacing if there's multiple lines or the letter spacing just to space them out a bit further. This boundary box here can be made smaller and then you can press in the middle and just move this layer because it is a separate layer you can move it to fit exactly where you want it to. You can also add a background to your text as well by clicking the background tab, changing the color of it. You can make it more specific. You can make it lighter, make it darker, choose whatever you want. You can also add an outline to the text itself if you want to make it look a bit more bold, as well as a drop shadow. So that adds a drop shadow to the actual boundary that we've added there. So you can see it's not added it to the text, but it's added to the background. If we didn't have a background, it would just add it to the text. But it's up to you to decide how useful and how important those drawing and those text tools are in Pixlr. It's there to be used and it can be quite creative for the right project, but for basic photo editing, you probably won't use it a massive amount. One of the latter options that we've got on our vertical toolbar is called Add Element. Now these are again like special effects. It gives you a submenu here about overlays, borders, shapes and stickers. Some are free, some are premium features and you'll know the difference between them by having this little yellow tag on the options. So you can have a look through some of the elements that you can add. Things like bokeh can be kind of quite nice and it gives you some presets here that are made. You click on it and it'll automatically add it to your image as a new layer. So you can tweak it still, you can go back, change the position of it, as it says, change the transparency, the position, so you can rotate it around. These are just kind of quick little uh, extra files that you can throw on top of your image just to make something a little bit more design-led if you prefer.
There's other ones such as snow. So if you wanted to add a slightly more festive effect to your image, these can be kind of quite nice to just make things a little bit more seasonal, add a little bit more of an atmospheric effect if you wanted to. But let's have a look at some of the other options. Now with border, again, some will be premium, but there are some free ones in here as well. Um, depending upon the actual look of your finished image you want, you may not touch these at all, but let's just press on the uh, Art Deco and see what it can do for us. We press on the image and then it automatically applies it in the right orientation to the photograph that we've got. We can change the transparency again as we've looked at before. So if you want to add something a little bit more quirky, let's say, <laughs> it's not my cup of tea particularly, um, but it's something that, that can be used for the right image. I think if you've got a more of a period portrait, if you're trying to create an image that is um, from yesteryear, you're trying to make it look a little bit more old school and a bit sepia, these are things that could be quite useful just to finish off that effect to make it look a bit more authentic. But there are other options. Again, there's premium options still that you can play with. Um, but there's other ones that are maybe a little bit more modern with some of these nice color swirls that you've got. So these could be fun for kids' portraits if you wanted to frame them. The other options that we've got are shape and sticker. Again, very, very similar. Some premium, some are free. You can press on the heart and then it can add that heart as a new layer. You can resize it. So if you're wanting to make maybe a little gift card or some seasonal cards or a Valentine's Day card in this instance, these are all really, really useful little elements that you can throw on top. Same with the stickers. These are really, really kind of good little aspects for kids to play around with as well. If you ever wanted to get your children into photo editing, you can make them a little bit larger. These are the types of things you can maybe kind of position over a portrait and put onto someone's face perhaps. So our very last panel is add image. We've already got an image on screen here and we've already seen how we can uh, open an image to begin with, but this is always very, very useful if you wanted a quick tab just to go back and add more images to your creation. So if you wanted to add a few more images to your project, you can simply press browse and it will bring up your Windows Explorer or your Mac Explorer. You can also add an image if you know the exact URL where it is on the internet. Or, quite handily, if you've not got any images at all that you just wanted to practice with, you can use the stock website that it's attached to with Pixlab. So, if, for example, if we want to search for a car, type in car, and then we've got images here. Say, for example, if we wanted to use this one, it's loading it from Unsplash, which is a free website where you can use images that are not copyrighted um, and they're royalty free. So we can, it's asking us here, we, uh, do we want to kind of use this image as a new image completely um, or add it onto the current image that we've got. So if we press add to current, you'll see it's now loaded that image on top of our current image. And then we've got the two combined together. So then we can kind of go through and play with the, the layer blend modes and we can merge the two together in some sort of kind of creative car nature photograph. So there we go, we've completed our look at Pixlr, the free online editor that you can get access to as soon as you become an iPhotography member. Remember, once you've finished with all your editing and all your tweaking, make sure you're pressing apply when you're changing any of the values and any of the buttons on each of the panels throughout. And then when you've finished and you're ready to save your project, then make sure you press save in the bottom corner. So I hope you've enjoyed this little walkthrough. If you've got any questions, then please get in touch with the iPhotography team. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining me and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye now.